right. Welcome. It is February 15th, 2023, we hope. And today is Pari Nirvana Day, which is the day that we traditionally observe the passing of the historical Buddha into Nirvana. Um, last year, and uh, last year we spent some time actually talking about the story of the Buddha's entry into Nirvana. But this year we're doing something a little bit different. So it's also a perfect time to appreciate the effect that the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, which is uh, supposed to be the final teaching given by Shakyamuni on the occasion of his entrance into Nirvana. And we want to look at the, uh, some of the effect that the Mahaparinirvana Sutra had on Tiantai thought. Uh, but <laughs> that would be a pretty monumental task. So instead, we're going to pick uh, one particular example. And we have uh, somebody trying to move. Um, so we're going to pick one particular example. Uh, and in this case, uh, what I find particularly interesting about this is that what GE is trying to do is use the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra to explore ideas that he says are unexplainable. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm very much indebted to uh, Paul Swanson's uh, book, Foundations of Tiantai Philosophy. And in that book, he has done a partial translation of the Fawa Shuanyi, which is translated as the profound meaning of the Lotus Sutra. And it's a commentary on the Lotus Sutra, but it incorporates a lot of ideas from the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra. So the text was originally taught by GE and then recorded by his disciple Guan Ding, who also recorded other famous texts of his, uh, including Makashi Khan, which we have a dedicated study group for. So it's particularly interesting that G looks toward the chapter on noble activity from the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra to, in his terms, clarify the meaning of the Four Noble Truths. And Swanson, in his Foundations of Tiantai Philosophy, says that G is using terminology from the chapter, but it seems like the classification he has is actually original to him. So using this terminology from Mahapari Nirvana Sutra, Ji recontextualizes the Four Noble Truths in terms of a more abstract teaching, which is the Threefold Truth, which is very distinctive to Tiantai thought. The method is interesting. By combining teachings and explaining them in terms of each other, a new meaning of each teaching arises. And this is sort of leveraging the idea of dependent origination, which is a foundational Buddhist teaching. Namely, that a singular causes do, do not produce effects. It's the combination of causes and conditions that give rise to effects. And so if this principle is true, it should work in the context of studying sutra as well. We could also say that in another sense, G is doing what we would call thought experiments. Uh, we can pick a teaching that's widely agreed upon to be true, for instance, the Four Noble Truths, and then read this in terms of a more subtle or ambiguous teaching. If a contradiction arises that can't be sufficiently resolved, we found something unsound in our understanding and have to go back to the drawing board. This process of thinking through teachings in terms of each other allows us to make an abstract teaching more concrete. For, uh, our assumptions for this discussion are, in general, that teachings from the Buddhist canon are true, which we can hopefully agree on. Uh, and specifically, we're talking about the Four Noble Truths and the, and the Threefold Truths, but other, other teachings will come up in the discussion. And uh, I particularly, I picked this quote from G that comes right before the section where he talks about four ways of understanding the Four Noble Truths, where he says that the Tathagata takes that which is beyond conceptualization and uses expedient means to explain it crudely. How can one isolate the crude as ultimately different from the subtle? And then Swanson puts in parentheses, one cannot, mm -hmm. in case you were unsure. So the scope of this discussion is actually, we're only covering a very short section of the profound meaning of the Lotus Sutra, roughly three pages out of the nine page section that is about the Four Noble Truths. And GE divided the section on the Four Noble Truths into four parts, the clarification of the content of the Four Truths, classification into crude and subtle, exposing the crude and manifesting the subtle, and contemplating the mind. But we're only going to be using sections one and three. And it's mostly going to be section one. We're going to be looking at the, uh, what he calls the clarification of the Four Noble Truths. So in case we aren't sure, the Four Noble Truths are generally considered to be the truth of dukkha, the truth of the cause of dukkha, the truth of extinction, and the truth of the path. And dukkha itself is a very interesting term because it normally is translated as suffering. That's the standard that we're used to seeing. But 
There's at least a theory that etymologically it comes from the idea of a hole that is not perfectly round. And it's to be understood in the context of if you have uh, a cart, it's extremely unpleasant to ride in it when it's going bump, 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 bump the whole time because the wheels are stuck. Well, that's kind of what life is like, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so the Four Noble Truths are the earliest teaching after the Avatamsaka Sutra, according to uh, Master Ji's way of classifying the time periods of the teachings. But everyone can agree that it's one of the earliest Buddhist teachings. And the Four Noble Truths are relatively simple to understand because they appeal to our direct experience. Now, another teaching that's going to be important for this discussion is the Fourfold Teachings. And Koshin gave us an excellent presentation talking about the Fourfold Teachings uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So those are probably fairly fresh in our mind, but just as a refresher, the, four, the Fourfold Doctrines of Conversion are what's going to be interesting for us, which are the Tripitaka, the Shared, the Distinct, and the Complete. And Ji used these to elaborate, elaborate and reconcile the varied content of sutras that had been attributed to Shakyamuni Buddha. So in this discussion, these categories actually get mapped uh, to the understanding that practitioners have of the Four Noble Truths. So Master Ji talks about uh, understanding the Four Noble Truths in terms of arising and perishing, neither arising nor perishing, immeasurable and spontaneous and those map directly onto the four. Uh, this teaching is more abstract, but it's relatively easy to understand. It's basically a classification system, so not too difficult. Now, the next truth that's going to, the next uh, teaching that's going to be important to us is the threefold truth, which is the truth of phenomenal appearances, the truth of ultimate reality, and the truth of the middle. So this idea is sort of taken from Kumara Jiva's translation, translation of Nagarjuna's Mula Madhyamaka Karika in which, uh, in chapter 24, verses 8 and 9, he writes, All things which arise through conditioned co-arising I explain as emptiness. Again, it is a conventional designation. Again, it is the meaning of the middle path. And the Mulamanyama Gakarika actually has a very large influence on the way that GE understands Buddhist teachings. Uh, so much so that he actually uh, credits Nagarjuna as being the first patriarch of the Tiantai school. So the Threefold Truth proposes a middle way that's not simply the center point between two extremes, but one that resolves inconsistencies in Buddhist philosophical positions by taking a multivalent approach to truth or reality. In other words, we have different perspectives on truth, as opposed to just saying we pick a point in between, right, and do half and half. So this teaching is very abstract. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it goes against our direct experience, and uh, I would say it's relatively difficult to understand, at least in depth. So at this point, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> I want to take a little bit of time to look at G's four ways of understanding the Four Noble Truths. So the first category is arising and perishing. And he writes that this refers to the understanding of the Four Noble Truths by those who are heavily deluded concerning the real, because it is understood in accordance with phenomenal appearances. The second category, neither arising nor perishing, is the understanding of the Four Noble Truths by those who are lightly deluded concerning the real, because it is understood in accordance with reality. And this is understood to be the truth of emptiness or shunyata. The third is the immeasurable, which is the understanding of the Four Noble Truths by those who are heavily deluded concerning the middle, because it is understood in accordance with phenomenal appearances. And the spontaneous is the understanding of the Four Noble Truths by those who are lightly deluded concerning the middle, because it is understood in accordance with reality, or again, emptiness. Shunyata. Next slide, please. So immediately a pattern emerges with, re, uh, with respect to both the fourfold teachings and the threefold truth. Can you define phenomenal appearances? Yeah, sure. So this is uh, basically your everyday experience. What, what, of the what was the question? Define phenomenal appearances. Yeah, so phenomenal appearances uh, in this context, this is your everyday experience of the world, right? Um, sometimes very accurate, sometimes very deceptive. And then the idea of the real or ultimate reality in this case is sort of the, the, the true principle that's 
behind all of these phenomenal appearances, right? This is sort of their unifying factor, if that makes sense. But phenomenal appearances, we also use the term provisionally real, um, the provisional, et cetera, but we're really talking about your everyday experience in that context. But hopefully, as we go on, um, one of the reasons I wanted to do this discussion is because I think that the threefold truth is uh, somewhat difficult to understand. So moving on from here, uh, immediately a pattern emerges with, uh, with respect to both the full, fourfold teachings and the threefold truth. So arising and perishing and neither arising nor perishing can be understood in terms of how one understands what is ultimately real with respect to the relationship between phenomenal appearances and ultimate reality. The immeasurable not spontaneous, on the other hand, can be understood in terms of how one understands the middle with respect to those same two categories of the first two, the threefold truth, phenomenal appearances and ultimate reality. So in this case, the crude, we'll say, uh, teaching of the Four Noble Truths can actually reveal the subtle teaching of the Threefold Truth. And we're going to track the change from the first two truths being understood in terms of their relationship to ultimate reality to their being understood in terms of the middle. This is what's of interest to us. Uh, next slide, please. So on to the clarification proper. So the Four Noble Truths in terms of arising and perishing is very much in line with uh, how we would learn the Four Noble Truths if we picked up a book on basic Buddhism. So this is probably what most people are familiar with. And uh, this, these particular uh, quotations are actually taken from the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, and G uses this in profound words of the Lotus Sutra as how he explains this, this idea. So in this particular understanding of the Four Noble Truths, the truth of suffering refers to the heavy burden, oppression, and bondage of the senses and their objects. And this is the truth of Dukkha. The truth of the cause of suffering is that which is able to attract the results of various mental and emotional delusions and passions. The truth of extinction is severing the bonds of causes and results in this samsaric world of 25 modes of existence. And the truth of the path is that which is able to remove the basis of suffering, the precepts, meditation, and wisdom, and insight into the truths of transiency, suffering, and emptiness. So, <laughs> why do there need to be more ways of understanding the Four Noble Truths? Well, there's an underlying assumption to this way of understanding the Four Noble Truths, which is that if we were to understand phenomenal appearances or sort of our conventional experience completely through some form of analysis, then we would be able to so sever the bonds of causes and results by practicing the Eightfold Path. Seems like a sound assumption. But historically, this actually led to an interesting contradiction, which uh, Nagarjuna explores in depth in the Mulamanyamaka Karika, and then, of course, Master GE uh, doesn't explore it in depth because he assumes that we already know about this. But if we, if we use this perspective only, uh, it leads to an interesting contradiction that analyzing the ultimately real in terms of phenomenal appearances led to arguments that essentially had to propose something similar to Atman, which contradicts one of Shakyamuni Buddha's central teachings, which is his denial of Atman. And we could also say that basically you end up having to posit some form of eternalism. So we can say that this first classification is true if we qualify it by saying that it's true in terms of phenomenal appearances, but not ultimately true. This crude understanding reveals something about the subtle truth that is within the teaching of the Four Noble Truths as a whole. So what's the problem with analyzing the ultimately real in terms of phenomenal appearances? Well, the first problem we have is we need a way to rigorously understand what phenomenal appearances are. Craig was jumping the gun with this question. So traditionally, this was accomplished by saying that there were, at some level, some phenomena that were ultimately real, while the rest weren't. One of the criteria for ultimately real phenomena is that they cannot be composable or built from other things. So they have to be a fundamental building block of our experience. So a classical analogy of this is a chariot. We call it a chariot, but it's assembled from a set of discrete pieces, such as wheels, an axle, etc. And in this sense, a chariot is only provisionally real. 
There was a time before the chariot was assembled and a time after it is no longer assembled. So we could say a chariot is really just wheels and other things in a certain state at a certain moment in time. The issue with this analysis, though, is where does it stop? If we say the wheels are ultimately real, this is a clear contradiction because they are composed of other things, like wood, metal, the labor used to create them, etc. So logically, we just created a situation where the wheel could not have been made in the first place. It always had to be there. Much less could the chariot ever be assembled. And if there's no time before the wheel is assembled, the wheel always existed and it must be eternal. The alternative, though, is an infinite regress. We have to keep decomposing things until we eventually reach something that is ultimately real. To solve this problem, the idea was posited that all phenomenal appearances are composed. And this saves us from both the infinite regress and contradictions arising from treating phenomenal appearances as being ultimately real. We call this uh, the idea of emptiness, or shunyata. So if all phenomenal appearances are composed of other things, then in an ultimate sense, they are not real. However, this does not deny that they are provisionally real and clearly part of our experience. Now with this, we can move on to the second way of understanding the Four Noble Truths. Slide, please. Which is the Four Noble Truths as neither arising nor perishing. And this is a consequence of sort of working through this problem with the first way of seeing them. And in this case, the Four Noble Truths are expressed as the truth of suffering has no mark of oppression. The causes of suffering have no mark of fusing. Extinction has no mark of arising, and the path has no mark of duality. So the assumption here is that the reality behind phenomenal appearances is the truth of shunyata, the truth that they are empty. The fact that dharmas don't have any substantial marks or characteristics. All of their characteristics come from elsewhere. But this again leads to an interesting contradiction. So analyzing ultimate reality in terms of itself leads to an obvious question. What's the purpose of the Buddhist path if we're no longer concerned with phenomenal appearances? We've essentially proposed a form of annihilationism, which is a direct contradiction of Shakyamuni Buddhist teachings. So phenomenal appearances have now been flattened and their distinctions are no longer preserved. Uh, the characteristics that define them are now basically a single characteristic, which is their emptiness. So we can say in this case that this classification is true if we qualify it by saying it's true in terms of ultimate reality, but not in terms of phenomenal appearances or the middle. Slide, please. <clears throat> now something exciting happens. We're ready to start looking at the middle with respect to the threefold truth. So we've examined in depth uh, looking at things in terms of phenomenal appearances and then looking at them in terms of their ultimate reality. So now we need to try and synthesize these views because those, both of those views on their own don't really hold water. They both run into issues very quickly. So the understanding of the Four Noble Truths as immeasurable is that ignorance uh, has immeasurable marks because the fruits of the ten Dharma realms are not the same. The causes have immeasurable marks because the passions of the five levels are not the same. Extinction has immeasurable marks because all of the perfections of virtue are not the same. And the path has immeasurable marks because the Buddha Dharma, immeasurable as the sands of the Ganges River, is not all the same. And the assumption underlying this understanding is that dharmas are ultimately empty, yet appear provisionally. Their ultimate emptiness puts them in the realm of pure potential, but our direct experience is equally undeniable. So we need ways to be able to talk about them and understand them. As a consequence, Phenomenal appearances are minimally constrained. All we can say for certain is that they're ultimately empty, which leaves them essentially immeasurable in their extension. The problematic flattening of categories that resulted from understanding the Four Noble Truths in terms of neither arising nor perishing is actually beneficial in this case. It freed us from our earlier rigidity and understanding, where we saw the relationships of phenomena as hierarchical. Now we see that all phenomenal appearances can be understood in terms of each other, because each of them is related to all of the other things through causation. And this is a more advanced understanding of emptiness. In fact, the only way we can understand things is in terms of other things. And if this sounds like a controversial claim, this is essentially what a dictionary is. Additionally, immeasurability is foundational to the notion of upaya. We can understand reality more deeply by understanding things in terms of their interpenetration and then we can explain and embody the teachings in any way necessary for the situation, as long as we aren't contradicting Buddhist teachings, which is very important. 
Well, this sounds pretty great, right? So why is there a fourth one? Yet again, excellent question. We've essentially renamed things, and that's the sort of contradiction that we have here. Despite developing our intuition with respect to the middle, we are still understanding the middle in terms of phenomenal appearances, but not shunyata. But we have resolved the contradictions of eternalism and annihilationism, so we have a net game here. We are moving forward. We can say that this classification is true if we qualify it by saying it is true in terms of using phenomenal appearances to understand the middle, but not in terms of understanding the reality of the middle. And this leads us to the final classification. Please. which is the Four Noble Truths as spontaneous. And this could potentially be the most confusing one. Uh, we have a lot of time for questions, though, so... <laughs> uh, the Four Noble Truths is spontaneous. So I actually took this quote directly from Fawa Shuanyi, and uh, you can look at my numbering. It is intentional that it's one, two, four, three. Um, for a few categories, uh, Master G does not use the truths in the order that you normally speak of them. Uh, so I didn't want it to be confusing when suddenly I did them in a different order this time. Uh, when one is deluded concerning reality, to misunderstand the fact that enlightenment is passions is called the truth of causes. And to misunderstand the fact that nirvana is samsara is called the truth of suffering. When one has understanding concerning reality, to know that passions are actually enlightenment is called the truth of the path. And to know the identity of nirvana and samsara is called the truth of extinction. The integrated nature of phenomena with reality is the middle. There is no conceptualization, no thought, no one who creates or makes anything. Therefore, it is called spontaneous. Well, here we are, I guess. We found the, uh, the most complete way of, of seeing this, right? So the assumption here is that dharmas are ultimately empty and provisionally real, and that this relationship is experienced as the integration of all phenomena. Distinctions are still preserved, yet they're malleable. We can see the immeasurability of the things that we encounter. Phenomenal appearances, ultimate reality, and the middle have united as an integrated single truth, or one truth is a term that Master G uses. So we should be all good, right? Uh, this view addresses the previous contradictions and presents a fairly holistic view by balancing and integrating the threefold truth, but is still presented as being lightly diluted with respect to the middle, as GE classifies it. And this brings up an interesting point, which is that in presenting these four ways of understanding the Four Noble Truths, all of them are correct in some sense, and all of them are incorrect in some sense, which is why he spends time at the beginning of this section actually going through these modalities of looking at the Four Noble Truths and comparing them to the Threefold Truth, and then also combining that with the Fourfold Teachings. The reasoning behind this is that from his perspective, uh, all, of, all of these different perspectives have different value at different times based on where a practitioner is in their Buddhist journey. And one of the things that Master Ji does extremely well is he creates these, these sort of huge encyclopedic ways of understanding something that's as straightforward as the Four Noble Truths. By taking all of these ideas from various sutras, especially the Mahaparinirvana Nirvana Sutra and the Lotus Sutra, and then using those to try and reread all of the earlier teachings that originally seemed fairly simple to understand and fairly concrete. But this creates an interesting effect, because we have difficult things like the teaching of Shunyata, or the notion of the two truths, the three truths, etc. And by using something like the Four Noble Truths and then reading it in terms of the threefold truth, at least for me, it actually helps because it gives you examples of how to understand the differences between those categories. I think it's very confusing, uh, the difference between phenomenal appearances, ultimate reality, and then what the middle is, right? And hopefully going through this classification was at least somewhat helpful in that respect. But at the end of the day, uh, next slide, please. Um, we need to understand that Gene's methodology should be seen as an attempt to explain the unexplainable. The exercise of classification and clarification of fundamental Buddhist teachings gives us, in his terms, a crude means to tease out the subtle understanding of those teachings in terms of complex doctrines. 
But this has a secondary effect of clarifying our understanding of the more subtle abstract teachings as well by making them more concrete. We take a well-understood teaching and broaden our understanding of its depth while simultaneously gathering examples to deepen our understanding or intuition of teachings that are beyond satisfactory direct explanation. In other words, things can be illustrated rather than explained. For G, the teachings that we call crude are actually subtle. And the teachings that we call subtle, he describes as being crude in reality. He summarizes uh, his discussion on the Four Noble Truths by saying that in these various ways, all are complete and partake in subtlety. The conventional is exposed and the real is made manifest. For all four understandings of the Four Noble Truths to be unexplainable is of a high level. For all four to be explainable shows the vastness of their essence. For the four to be both explainable and unexplainable shows the length of their function. For the four to be neither explainable nor unexplainable is for them to be neither high nor vast nor long nor short nor one nor differentiated. They are all the same in being called subtle. This is what I have for you. Next slide, please. And um, first, I would like to invite uh, Ichishima Sensei uh, to bring in anything that he would like to. This is a extremely large topic, and so I try to constrain it a lot. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, this uh, uh, Nirvana Day today. This is a very uh, showing the what everything is. Uh, phenomenal life is changing and uh, when we are free from all attachment uh, our att attachment is a um, ma major problem for us living beings and we have so many attachment but uh, if we clarify those attachment they are uh, uh, composed of cause and uh, relations so that is uh, uh, we, we when we are free from all such uh, attachment, then uh, nirvana comes. So that's kind of thing. So we are, uh, we have in Japanese iroha uta. It's a basic uh, what shall it, Japanese uh, alphabet, which was composed by uh, kukai kobo daishi, but uh, not uh, uh, no one knows clearly. Uh, I think iroha nyoido chirinuru wo. Even the fragrance flower uh, is not uh, eternal. How, why uh, much less our life is? And Shonyo uh, Mujo, they show me this is arising and uh, perishing. But when we uh, go beyond that kind of uh, phenomena, our sufferings, then uh, we come to uh really nirvana uh so iroha ni o edo chiri nuru o wagai o tare so tsune naran ui no okuyama kyo o koete asaki yume mishi ehi mo sesu so these uh, four phrases immeasurable uh, phrases this is a uh, very basic of understanding buddhist uh, teachings and uh, shakamyon muni buddha uh <clears throat> himself uh, perished at the age of 80. Now I, I am 83 years old, still uh, far beyond Shakyamuni Buddha. It's very, very uh, uh, important to understand how we live uh, in this life because we have so many sufferings. But when we see the real truth of suffering, then we can get uh, rid of such suffering because everything is changing. Everything is changing. And so much more, our life is also changing. So every day is different. But uh, when we understand such a basic changing uh, samsara, uh, then we, we can uh, be free from such attachment. I think that is nirvana. Nirvana is a Sanskrit word which means Put off uh, the flavor of, of, of 
put off the light of light, you see. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, Nirvana uh, is very important meanings. Uh, so but very, but difficult. But uh, I think uh, when we understand reality, why I am here, oh, this is very important uh, topic, I think. Thank you. This is my comment. Thank yes, so thank you very much.